May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good afternoon. I had to check before I said, or almost said good morning. Uh, it's lovely to be back. If you remember last week, we were talking about Mary. Last week, the church celebrated the Annunciation when Gabriel came and announced to Mary that she was going to give birth to the Son of God. Uh, and I, I want to just take a, a point from that and perhaps develop it a little bit this morning. And it fits in very nicely with what has already been said. Uh, a couple of things specifically. But before I, I read uh, the passage that I want to read, I want to remind you of a couple of verses from Luke 1 that we read last week. And then once we read that, we're going to go to Galatians chapter 4. So first of all, Luke 1, verses 34 and 35. So just to set the scene for you while you're turning to that, uh, Gabriel has appeared to Mary. Gabriel has told Mary what is going to happen. And Mary now responds with this question. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. That's just that initial response from the angel. The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And I want to suggest to you this morning that that is what God calls us to in our relationship with him. God wants us to dwell in his presence. God wants us to allow the Holy Spirit to overshadow us. God wants the Holy Spirit to come upon us so that we are people who are overshadowed by the Spirit and upon whom the Holy Spirit comes in power. Now, I believe that for Mary, that that didn't just happen once. You know, the God, the Holy Spirit, came upon her and suddenly she was pregnant. And inside her was the beginnings of a little baby who would become, or even from that moment, who was God incarnate, Jesus Christ. I believe Mary had the experience of that overshadowing right through her pregnancy. How wonderful must that have been? You know, such was the, the presence of God upon her and obviously within her that when she greeted Elizabeth, the Holy Spirit filled Elizabeth and the baby John inside Elizabeth leapt for joy. And John was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. How wonderful. Now let's turn to Galatians 4. Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> 
So the context of this is that the gospel has been preached to the Galatian Christians. Galatians who rather strangely were possibly related to the Vikings. What's that all about? We'll maybe talk about that another day. But they reckon that these Galatians were descendants of uh, Norsemen who had made their way out that direction. A little bit of Bible trivia for you, or uh, history for you. The Galatians had received the gospel in all its fullness. And now false teachers had come into the church in this whole area of Galatia. And they were beginning to spread a false gospel which taught that the Christians had to follow the ways of Judaism, and if they didn't, then they weren't Christians. Uh, they weren't God's people. Paul was combating that and saying, look, that's not true. Christ saves you. Works of the law do not save you. And if you try to replace Christ with the works of the law, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. That's a, that's a shocking statement, but that's exactly what he said. And so, with that in mind, let's read from Galatians chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me because I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if, I could have done, if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. One Corinthians 11 verse 28 says that we should examine ourselves. We should look at our lives. And Paul again in 2 Corinthians talks about testing ourselves to see if we are in the faith. <laughs> Those are amazing statements. Am I really in the faith? Am I walking as I should? Think of Paul with the Galatians. And Paul in Corinthians talks about the burden of the churches and the pressure that he feels because the burden that is on him as a result of his concern for the churches. He is weighed down 
and burdened. And particularly in this instance at this time for the Galatian churches. Such is the nature of his burden that he's, it, it, it's just at the back of his mind, there's this little thought, I have wasted my time. Now that's, we really, we really need to take that to heart. And then he says, I am once again in the pain of childbirth. He is birthing a church. And he feels the pain of that process. And the desire of his heart is that Christ be formed in them. Just as Christ was formed in Mary. And what is the key? The key is to be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and to allow the Holy Spirit to come upon us in power. Because when that happens, we are changed. We are transformed from what we are and what we have been into what God wants us to be. And we are more and more conformed to the image of Christ. That idea of, of Christ being formed in the Galatians, to, to form means, uh, well, it, it has an outer and an inner application. So it means to take on the appearance of another and that's the outside now we don't take on the physical appearance of Christ but what does happen and what can be observed is that our behaviors and our actions become more Christ like so I want to suggest to you that that's how Christ is formed in us on the outside as a, a, a consequence of our actions. Our actions become Christ-like. But an inner forming occurs as well. And that inner forming refers to our character and our nature. I think of that. Paul's desire for the Galatians was that the character and nature of Christ would be formed in them, would grow and develop and be formed in them. And then as a consequence, they would begin to look more and more like him from the outside in respect of their behaviors and actions. So when we are like Christ on the inside, we become like Christ on the outside. We all know that, don't we? And of course, Paul goes on and speaks to the Galatians in chapter five and talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And interestingly, in, in 2 Peter 1, Peter gives his own list of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And some of it's the same as Paul's, and some of it's different. And Paul has some stuff that, that Peter doesn't have. So actually, we end up with an even bigger list. But what Paul, or sorry, what Peter says, which is really interesting, he says, if these characteristics are present and growing in your life, they will keep you from being unproductive and ineffective in your relationship with God. And what he says is in your knowledge of Christ. 
but he's talking about an experiential daily walking in relationship with God. Not only God the Son, but God the Father and God the Holy Spirit as well. So if we want to be productive and effective for God in the world, then the fruit of the Spirit must grow in us. Or to put it another way, Christ must be formed in us. And if Christ is to be formed in us, the power of the Most High must come upon us. And the Holy Spirit must be allowed to overshadow us. Because these are things which when the Spirit is present, they happen automatically. Take, take love, the fruit of the Spirit, love. Now, it's not a human love. The word is agape which is used, not always, but most often, of the love of God. And th there's a lovely verse in, uh, in Romans. So I'm trying to break in a new Bible. That sounds terrible. So that's why I have two with me. But if I want to look something up, I have to go back to Old Faithful. Unfortunately, Old Faithful is falling apart. Uh, but... Listen to this, and again, this talks into what has already been said this morning, and the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And one way of thinking about deep calling to deep is, this is a, isn't a definitive answer, uh, but it, it's one way of looking at it. Often scripture has shades of meaning. But if we, you read from Romans 8, where the Spirit intercedes for us. Uh, but earlier in Romans 8, it also talks about, and we've said this often, the Holy Spirit presenting evidence to our spirits that we are the sons of God. Uh, This idea of the Holy Spirit coming upon us and ministering to us in our inner being, in the depths of us, in our very souls, and the deep things of God call to the deep things of us. And as a consequence of that interaction, we are changed. How wonderful. Because in being changed, we become useful to God. Listen to Romans, I think it's chapter 5. So this, we're thinking about agape love. Romans 5, 5. God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Now think about that for a moment. God the Father sends the Holy Spirit to us. And we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And according to Romans 5, 5, the Holy Spirit comes and ministers the love of the Father to us. And we feel his love. We are comforted by his love. And in being comforted and loved, we are changed. And so the fruit of that encounter grows within us. <laughs>
the love of God. And so, for example, Paul in Philippians 1, I think it's verse 9, is able to say to the Philippians, I long for you with the affection of Christ. How, how wonderful, not, not just his own longings as a human being who cares for these people, but the very heart of God is being ministered to him and the longing that he has for the Philippians is from the very heart of God and he longs with the love of of Christ. Imagine. Imagine being so overshadowed by the Holy Spirit that we experience the very heart of God for others. And you know what? We need that. And one of the things that's present in both Paul's list and in Peter's list of the fruits of the Spirit is love. Love, God's love, is paramount. It should be a prayer of ours that we are filled with the love of God for one another and for the lost. For our brothers and sisters and for those who are lost. Now imagine the Father's heart for the lost. He loved so much that he gave his only son. And the, the son loved so much that he was prepared to be given. And in that interaction within the Godhead, before the very foundation of the world, a plan was formulated. Agreement was reached. Now remember, nothing's created at this stage. They could have just said, let's not bother. But no, such was the love that existed within their relationship together. They just had to share. We can't keep this to ourselves. This is too good. But there is no one else. Well then we will create. But they will reject us. Well then we will reconcile them to ourselves. High through death and resurrection, all because of love. Their love for one another and their eternal love. For something they hadn't even made yet. Can you feel? Can you feel that? What a God. Right, I better change tack or I'm going to be crying in a minute. Isn't that lovely?
After Paul talks in Galatians 4 about Christ being formed in the church, he then begins to mention the Spirit. He's mentioned it a little in the previous part of the the letter, but now he really goes for it. So let me just run through. Twice he says, live by the Spirit. And he does that in, in, in reference to two things. First of all, we are made alive by the Spirit. We were spiritually dead, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and we are made alive. It's like our souls are born again. It's like we have been created anew. And so Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, everything is new. You're like a new spiritual baby brought into the world by the Spirit. But not only birthed by the Spirit, but also enabled to live because of the Spirit. Remember, Spirit means breath, Hebrew, Ruach. The very breath of God gives you new life and then keeps you alive. He talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and we've already mentioned that. He talks about keeping in step with the Spirit and being led by the Spirit. That should perhaps remind us of the early chapters of Luke whenever he talks about how the Holy Spirit moves in the life of Jesus. We've already seen how As a result of the the activity of the Holy Spirit, God active in the world, Jesus is formed in Mary. He is born of the Spirit. At his baptism, he is filled with the Spirit. And immediately after that, he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And after his 40 days in the wilderness, He returns in the power of the Spirit. Uh, What a picture of the believer. Where God's plan for you and I is that we be born of the Spirit. That we live by the Spirit. That we are full of and empowered by the Spirit, full of and empowered by the Spirit. And that we live our lives ministering in that power. Acts 1 verse 8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be. Now in that case it was my witnesses. But for each one of us we're of course all called to be witnesses. But just that idea of just being for God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will receive power. And as a consequence of that impartation, you will be enabled to be. To be what God wants you to be.
Don't panic. We're not all rushing off to Africa or China as missionaries. And maybe being is nothing more than the lives we live at the moment. But if that is what God wants you to be, you don't be anywhere else. Because if you're somewhere else, you're there without the Spirit. God graces us by His Spirit with what we need for where He places us and where He wants us to be. That thing that we could call God's work. But let's not get it confused with a work for God. Because they are two different things. We are not called to do a work for God. We are called to do God's work. See the difference? Sowing and reaping, blessing and curse. If you sow to the Spirit, from the Spirit, you will reap eternal life. Now at some point you and I as children of God will enter into the fullness of that reaping and we will be in eternity with God. And how wonderful is that going to be? But in the meantime, we reap life today if we are sowing to the Spirit. If we are living by the Spirit, if we are walking in the Spirit, if we are being led by the Spirit, then we are in reality reaping the benefits of eternal life. And here again it brings me back to being overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 91 talks about dwelling in the presence of God. Let's That's not good. I've that many things bouncing about my head at the minute that I've forgotten what I wanted to say. There, there it is. Now listen, now re remember it, in light of Mary being overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 91 verse 1. He or she, the person who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Church, that is what we are called to. God's heart for you is that you rest in his shadow. What Jesus said about Jerusalem, how I long to gather you like chicks under a, a hen's wings. To bring you in and protect you from the elements and just snuggle down and you're in close and under the protection of my wings. But you would not. 
There is something, now we all know this, and I'm, I'm please, this is in no way meant to be condescending, and I'm talking to myself as much as to you. But there is such a beauty to the relationship which God calls us to have with him through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And there are times when we would not, we will not. Now the sad thing is we have and we know. But the Father says there's so much more. Allow the Holy Spirit to overshadow you. Jesus in, and I finish with this, Jesus in John 17. He's praying to the Father and he says, Father, this is eternal life to know you and the one you have sent. How do we know them? Through the overshadowing presence of the Holy Spirit. Paul prays in Ephesians 1 for the Ephesian believers and he says I, I pray that God would fill you with his Holy Spirit I pray that the Father would fill you with his Holy Spirit so that you might know him better there's the Father's heart for you know me Paul goes on in Ephesians 2 and he says we have access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And as we enter into the fullness of that God pours his love into our hearts. Father God pours his love into our hearts. I hope you're feeling it the way I'm feeling it this morning. The love of the Father for you. The love of the Son for you. The love of the Holy Spirit for you. All accessed through the indwelling presence of the Spirit. Whose all-consuming longing for you is that you allow yourself to be overshadowed. To know and to be known. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful father. What a wonderful spirit is ours. And you know the best thing. The spirit comes to us in his fullness. But his indwelling presence is only a foretaste 
of the eternal life which will be ours. I said I was finishing a minute ago, but I will finish with this. I know you should never say that because you never do. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is at a, a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. You are God's possession. One day you will be redeemed from this world and will enter your inheritance. In the meantime, be overshadowed by the Spirit. Amen.